You're listening to Investify, preaching financial independence and assisting investors to achieve a more flexible and free lifestyle through smart financial planning and real estate investing. If leaving the corporate world and jumping into this thriving industry is what you desire, tune in and listen to stories of like-minded individuals who made the leap to financial independence. Equip yourself with the right tips and tricks to start your real estate journey, making active or passive ventures that are highly profitable and rewarding. Here are your hosts, Craig Kerlop and Ziana McIntyre. What's going on, everybody? You are listening to Investify. My name is Craig Curlop, aka the Fi Guy, and I'm here with my co-host Ziana McIntyre, aka Z Money Z. How are you doing today? I'm good. I have been gone for a little while, and if you guys were really missing me, I hope you were following along on Instagram because I just bought a home in a new market and furnished it and documented the whole painful thing. Um, but it's doing really, really well. So that has been an exciting Yay. pursuit. Yes. Well, thank in you. Case they don't know to give us the deets. Where is it? What does it look like? Oh. Yeah. yeah. So I bought a 4-2 in Atlanta right outside of the perimeter. And people um, often think of Atlanta and go, ooh, that's just where Airbnb got outlawed. But if you're outside of the city, proper, you can do short-term rentals. And so I love being adjacent to an area where they're not illegal anymore because then you have a lot less competition than you used to have. And mm -hmm. we are shooting to do midterm rental primarily and uh, focus on insurance contracts. So we just got started. We just had our first booking that's wrapping up tomorrow. So we'll see how it all goes. Nice. Well, congrats. See, that's big stuff. Um, love to see that. And um, yeah. And speaking of Mm -hmm. ADUs, or what should we say, buying property <laughs> and maybe building, whatever, whatever it is. We got, you know, you know my sure. transitions are very good. We got the ADU guy, Derek Shirell, on today. And if you don't know Derek, he's pretty big on bigger pockets. He's definitely kind of like, he is, I've never met anybody that knows more about ADUs than this, than this guy. Like, I don't think there's a better person out there in this universe. And if there is, please let me know. Um, but he has been building ADUs since 1996. And he's not that old. He's like, I think he said he was like 42 or 43 on the show. And so like for more than half of his life, he's been building ADUs and that's been what he's what he does. And he just discloses some absolute bombs in here as to how it may not be as expensive as you may think, some things to look out for, and also how to even build one yourself is on his website. And so, um, yeah, Z, anything to add before we get into the show? Yeah, and actually, he had so much to say that all the way at the very end, he talks about his top three ways to make it an affordable build because he's really about affordable ADUs. So listen all the way to the end because you want those tips. Yeah, and it's at the I think it's even after the final four. Like it is at the very, very <laughs> it is. Like right it's after. He's like, right the last before thing. I go, let me tell you this one little thing. So yeah, make sure to listen all the way to the end. All right, let's bring on that ADU guy. Derek Shirell, aka that ADU guy. Welcome to the show, my friend. How you doing today, man? Doing great, Craig. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks so much for coming on. We got the Fi guy, that ADU guy, Z guy. Doesn't quite work since Z is that not a guy. That joke was so bad, and you did hey, it twice, Craig. Gal? Is Come that a new on. name? See? What do you think? I know. Well, the first time it wasn't the first time it wasn't recorded for everybody, so I needed the world to hear it. Um, all right, Derek. Speaking for the world to hear things and my bad jokes. Why don't you take us back to where it first started about how you got started in financial independence? Yeah, Craig. Thank you. So it's been really um, a multiple decades long journey, and it's kind of fitting that your you know, behind you is the book on house hacking. You're, you're known as the guy that wrote the book on that strategy. And I kind of grew up on the other end of the house hack. I was the one getting hacked with a single mom. We would always be renting some kind of um, secondary unit or some garage that had been illegally converted. And so really early on in my life, I realized that there was potential to make income from people that needed a place to live, from, from tenants. And being on the tenancy side, you know, it, it took me several years to realize I could be on the other end of that. 
Um, but I saw how real estate worked and I saw how assets produce cash flow at a young age because we were, um, you know, always kind of struggling to pay rent. Uh, fast forward a little bit. I was in high school. This is in the mid nineties. And my wood shop teacher um, handpicked a group of us. We thought we were special and he was selecting us because um, we were overachievers. Really, he saw in us that we were probably going to be troubled youth. He started a construction technology class and we built an illegal ADU for another one of my teachers. So um, for anybody that's listening that doesn't know what an ADU is, that's an accessory dwelling unit. And what makes it illegal versus legal? Well, just at the time, Craig, there wasn't legislation that supported this needed infill housing strategy that we have now. So we call them also legacy ADUs, and we can hopefully get into that a little bit later. Um, but the strategy that I've used for going on 30 years now is really just a house hack on steroids. So as opposed to having roommates and coming up with a master lease and trying to plead with underwriting that 75% of these rents can count to get loans towards your next deals. We just do it right. We, we separate these units. We put in separate utilities. We fire break the division between the units if they're attached. And um, we permit them as standalone independent dwellings. Okay, cool. And so do you need, do you end up changing the zoning to do this or do you have to change the zoning? Or are you able to do this without no. changing zoning? No, so we don't change any of the zoning at all. Um, spot zoning is really hard. You, a lot of times you have to change the comprehensive plan. There's big planning actions and public noticing that needs to take place. What we do is we look for areas, states and, and municipalities that specifically have really good infill housing legislation, uh, also known as ADU mm -hmm. code. So um, for Z over there, if, if you're going to be teaching somebody how to get into midterm rentals, you want to make sure that you become an expert in the zoning code in that market before you, you go by, make sure that you can do 30, 60, 90 day stays or, or short term stays. Very similar. So we don't, we don't have so to change the zoning. We're just because I have a property in Colorado Springs and much of Colorado Springs is zoned R2, which allows you to have a second dwelling. Um, and a lot of them are large lots. And mine in particular is a small one bedroom mm -hmm. house, but I could very easily put a one to two bedroom ADU in the back. But it's always felt really cost prohibitive to do that. And so I'm interested to hear a little bit more about, are you guys doing prefabs? Are you just doing straight build? Are you taking money from a HELOC? How are you making that worthwhile? Sorry. Yeah. yeah, yeah, a bunch of great questions. There's like four really good questions in there. So I'll kind of take them one by one. So it's okay. So first and foremost, that the power of the accessory dwelling unit strategy that hence has develop that ADU guy is it's accessory to the primary dwelling. And that's very, very important to understand is because we don't have to compete with multifamily investors and multifamily zones. So traditionally, historically, nationally, R1 means residential one unit. R2 or R3 means residential multiple units, usually on some kind of um, basis on a calculation of density. So as opposed to buying a multifamily lot like you have that can be developed into multiple single family houses or into a multifamily complex, the strategy that I really like and that I teach is buying single family houses in single family zones where you can build a second unit. It's just like a detached duplex. It's exactly like what you're asking, but the secret is it's in the legislation. So because it's accessory to the primary dwelling, we can tie in to the sewer of the existing house. We don't have to tap into the main 10 feet down in the asphalt in the middle of the street for 50 grand. We can tie in to the lateral of the water line to the existing house. We can jump off of the power of the primary house and still get that second single uh, that's that secondary standalone unit that would be like what you were asking. How do I build a multifamily? So that's kind of the the, the difference in the two zonings. Um, go ahead, Craig. I see you have your hand up. Yeah, I was just curious as to like that seems I haven't I guess in Denver, maybe it's different, but I haven't seen any sort of legislation or any sort of municipality that is like, I guess, OK with that. Um, maybe, maybe and maybe I'm wrong. Right. But like where like how do yeah, I Den know Denver has municipality? Works? Yeah, um, so this is what you'll hear me preach over and over, almost like a broken record. Become an expert 
in your local zoning code. So for your listeners out there right now, your, your followers that are like, oh, I want to be a house hacker. What do I do? Um, becoming an expert in a zoning code, Derek, that sounds crazy. You don't need a four-year degree. You don't need to go um, have some extravagant studies. You need to call, email, and go into your local planning and zoning office and ask them if you can build or convert an ADU at said address. For example, um, Denver has really good accessory dwelling unit legislation. Um, Mm -hmm. Little municipalities outside like Wheat Ridge, they do not. They do not allow ADUs. So it's literally as easy as calling, emailing, or going into your local planning and zoning office. So if you're in Denver proper, I would go to um, Denver Planning and Zoning. I would call the number. You'll probably get a message and you might get a call back in a week or two. So then I would send an email. And then I would also, if feasible, if that was in my market, I would go in and talk to one of the planning and zoning deputies and ask them about their okay, legislation. So I'm not going to let, say, Can you um, provide me the standards? I'm not going to let Craig know. hijack me because I had four questions yeah, ahead, in there. Um, so I'm just wanting to know, because it's R2, do you feel like it's a waste or that they wouldn't <laughs> yeah. allow doing an ADU? Mm-mm. No, no, it's not a waste. R2 is is amazing zoning. The more density, the better. We want housing. We want um, income. We want development. And uh, the the difference between being held to a multifamily standard and being held to an accessory dwelling unit standard really just comes down to costs. It's the costs of... um, of infrastructure and the cost of development. So if you were to become an expert in your local multifamily zoning code and you went into the zoning office and you said, can I have the booklet that that outlines the standards for multifamily development? It's like this thick. If you ask for the ADU code, it's like three or four pages. So multifamily development is awesome, but it's going to most of the time have all of its own designated utilities. It may or may not be able to be partitioned off into its own lot. Um, there are some nuances here, like if you're in California or you have listeners in California, we have SB8 and SB9 that just took place, which you can pretty much split any single family lot in two uh, with fee simple lot partitioning. So multifamily zoning is awesome. And yes, you could build a detached, smaller unit. Um, another huge benefit to ADUs are there's not an off street parking requirement in many cases. And one of the the poison pills, as we call it for infill housing, is parking and development standards. So if you are in a multifamily zone with a small 2-1 and you want to build another small 2-1 behind it, Z, and um, you go to the city and they say, yes, you can do it, but you're going to have to put in curbs and gutters. You're going to have to plant street trees. You're going to have to bring all new um, utilities from the street. These are all meter charges, just system development fees, we'll call them impact fees. And you're going to need two impervious paved off street parking spaces. So like you get all these standards piled onto you and this, the structure itself, let's just call it a a thousand square foot two one may cost you $150,000, but the infrastructure and the development and the parking may cost you another $150,000 for a multifamily unit. Whereas if it was an ADU, it would be so much less. Go ahead, Craig. Sorry. Yeah. I, I, this is one thing that I always run into is like, if I'm going to pay $150,000 to add the ADU, like why wouldn't I just buy another rental property at 20% down? Um, and then I get, you know, like without all that hassle and without, you know, all the, you know, all, all that. So yeah, pitch me there. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful question. And, and I would say to that and not in a defensive way, but it would be like, why would anybody ever buy a distressed property for cash? Well, it's because you're you're going to stabilize it and you're going to pull that money back out of it and recycle it. So an ADU is the same oh, way. Oh, you're chilling. Um, and just to di- I will get back to you, Z, on the costs. I I've, I've still have one more part of your question. But the, um, the benefit of taking that money and deploying it potentially uh, in another area may be more in line with some people's goals. But what I really try to do and what I practice is buying – only the very best properties that have infill housing potential in the very best areas. So the benefit being, I've already identified an amazing location. It has a flat lot. Hopefully it has alley access. There's amazing legislation. There's high demand for rents. There's very low vacancies. And I already own that dirt. So I basically have a free lot that I can build a project on. And we'll use your example of $150,000 one bedroom, one bath, 600 square foot detached ADU. Why would I take $150 of capital and deploy it right there as opposed to you know, buying a $650,000 house with 25% down? 
Um, the reason being is because I'm going to be able to pull my money back out of that with a couple of different strategies, whether I um, build it with a renovation loan, whether I build it with um, cash and then burn my money back out. It's, it's burr with one more, with one more B. So it's buy, build, you lose one of the R's for, for rehab because you don't have to rehab it. It's brand new. And that's what I really like to, um, to focus on is when you're building this, it's going to be brand new. So you're going to get a really good loan on it. I mean, I try to get, um, I try to leave at least 70, 30 LTV when I, when I recycle my money back out of here, I know I'm going to get an amazing tenant because it's in an amazing area. It's in a single family area, not that multifamily uh, zones are not as fun to live in, but usually there's higher traffic, maybe higher crime, maybe a train track, whereas these single family zones are more desirable. And more than anything, we're gonna have a really high demand, low supply product. So that that is um, you know a small, Primarily, we want it to be um, private. It's not a shared wall. You know, that this example we're using is a detached unit. So we have all these people in this market that are used to seeing a one bedroom, one bath of that size in an apartment complex. Now, all of a sudden, it has its own yard and it stands alone. And so it's a lot um, more higher demand practice, Craig. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I think I think that's great, man. I think that makes a lot of sense, um, especially if you're, I think a lot of people too, Z, I know you're kind of in this field of, you don't care to have as many yeah. units as possible. You'd rather have as more cash flow per property because you want less work. And I, I totally see the the um, the merits there as well as the ability to refinance because you are doing a little bit of a burr to the property as a whole when you can refinance and hopefully pull your money back out. Um, yeah. One question I've got for you. And so one thing that we really love to do is we like to kind of put, I call them ADUs, but they're attached ADUs um, by just kind of like separating the, ba like having a basement adding a kitchen or whatever downstairs and have that separate living space kind of within the house. And so obviously that'll be a little bit cheaper. You don't need to tie into new electrical or new plumbing. Uh, and so curious to hear, you know, your thoughts there versus the, you know, like the, the detached versus the attached. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Craig, you, you broke up for a portion of that, but I think I can fill in the blanks. And I, I believe you were asking about taking a portion of an existing house. I think house he's probably talking about building out like a ADU. basement unit right? and stuff like that. Right. Yeah. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. B build outs are amazing. I mean, a, an ADU con conversion is um, probably the, the, I would say one of the best cheat codes to wealth. Um, so again, back to the house hacking piece, somebody is buying a primary mortgage with anywhere from zero to 5% down with conventional financing, the best rate in the industry. And then you're converting a piece of that, whether it be an unfinished basement. Um, my favorite trick right now is to look and shop in zones where we know ADUs are allowed and buy properties that have illegal unpermitted ADUs, but they're in an area that allow them now and converting those spaces. So that's the most affordable option. Um, is uh, either a side-by-side -side or an over-under. I do tell people, unless you absolutely have to because you have an over-under space or you bought a house with uh, an unfinished basement, um, that you know we, we like to do side-by-side -side if we have to attach ADUs. So again, we're looking for a high demand, low supply product. So if we have an over-under ADU, we're very similar to a multifamily building where you have you know noise complaints, sound transfers. Um, we do like to soundproof our units. We use two, la two layers of 5 eighths type X drywall and uh, a proprietary soundproofing compound. So the sound transfer and the noise transfer as a tenant, um, growing up, listening to people running around above me, it's, it's something that still like sticks with me to this day. So one um, strategy that I'm currently using is two layers of 5 eighths drywall with a soundproof compound called green glue between the two layers. Um, but I would like to say, and this is really important for listeners if they're considering this strategy, is that tenants, um, they will pay for the same three things that owners pay for, in my opinion, based on my experience. And in this order, that's location, privacy, and amenities. So if you are going to look at taking down a property where you can do a, maybe a house hack on steroids where you're just converting the basement legally into a separate unit with its own utilities, but you don't have to go attached to utilities in the street so it's still affordable, um, you know, try to keep in mind that sound transfer because you are going to have a, re a reduced amount of rent and you're probably going to have less applicants in those spaces, but they are way more affordable. Um, one of my favorite strategies right now for the attached unit is to just do side by side, eliminate over-unders. I, I don't do them anymore. 
and side-by-sides. And the probably the easiest side-by-side ADU conversion is to look for a property that has a master bedroom on a split level that's away from the house because the hardest part of the ADU build and the most expensive part is the three inch sewer line to the bathroom. So if it has a bathroom in one section of the house, we can put in a one wall galley kitchen for $5,000. It's an absolute slam dunk. You can run power up over through the attic under the crawl space. You can run water on any plane, but sewer has to be on grade. So if you can find a house with a master bedroom on one side, even if it's a simple track house, three to 1500 square feet, if the master's on one side and has an exterior entrance, you can literally buy that house, pull the permits for an ADU in an ADU friendly city and put up two layers of five eighths drywall, put in a electrical disconnect, put in a smoke detector and a CO detector, and you all of a sudden have a one one and a two one. You can live in one side and pretty much cut your housing expense in half. I, I used to say pay for all of it. Um, but in this I would market, love us it, to it kind of break it, it down in a easy to digest way because there's been like a whole lot of information coming at the listeners. And I think some of them are on the newer side. They may have done like a house hack or two, but they're kind of early on. And so I I love the idea of owning in like an A neighborhood with good schools and all of that. But I've shied away from buying those homes because it's just felt like, you know, high price, not necessarily going to cash flow, may appreciate at some point. Um, but I'm loving this idea of if you get it right with the right zoning, you can actually use a loan Um, And I would love for you to kind of go through those a little bit slower of like the construction loan and the pros and cons there and then actually burr it. So you're taking some money out and then maybe you're really getting good cash flow. So can you break down maybe a specific deal that you've done recently with kind of today's high interest rates and all of that that people use as barriers to entry? Yeah, yeah, I can. And um, I'll try to take that kind of just as I heard it, uh, but for our listeners on the most basic level, if you're interested in this strategy and you own a house, call your local planning and zoning department, ask them if you can do an ADU conversion or new build at that address, period. That's where you start. If you're a new investor looking in new markets, I personally wouldn't be looking at any market where infill housing wasn't an allowable use. In other words, I don't buy anything that I can't either split the lot and build more houses or anything, I wouldn't buy anything that's not something like R2 like you have where there's a big lot and you have room later in 20 years, there's probably gonna be three units there. So that's kind of like the the rudimentary way of how to break it down. If you're a new investor and you're trying to deploy this strategy at a property you have uh, or into a market you're looking to go, I would look for free ADU plans. A lot of cities have free pre-approved plans You can take those plans to a couple of different appraisers and offer to pay them for their time. Hey, for a couple hundred dollars, will you give me a a market opinion on the value of this ADU? That way you know about what it's going to produce, what your ARV, if you will, in the normal real estate world will be. So the the biggest trick to lending is um, to to understand what the end value of this is going to be and to understand your market. And it's worth noting that the the process is gonna cost very similar amounts in Aspen as it will in think of the worst neighborhood in the worst city. I'm not gonna pick on anybody here, but um, you, this only works in some areas. So find a, a super simple, easy, affordable design that you think you can build or have built, take it to appraiser so you have a good idea of what the in value is gonna be, and then start shopping around for a construction loan. Um, the, the options that we have to fund these are going to depend on where you're at. So if you're in California, which is really the hot spot for accessory dwelling unit financing right now, there's a couple of California only based credit unions that have amazing products for these where they'll actually give you like a 9010 LTV loan on the finished value of the ADU before you build it. So if somebody wanted to build a, say it's a hundred thousand dollar ADU, they would fund $90,000 just based on the plans. Um, You have a bridge very similar to um, if you were gonna build a new house or if you're doing a burr with hard money, you have some kind of bridge product, this temporary loan that's gonna be good from anywhere from like six to 18 months. And then once it's done, you have to refi out of that. So you can think about it just like building a house or buying a house um, with conventional ways, but Another way that we try to fund these if we can is what I call by any means necessary. 
So um, looking at potentially borrowing, a lot of accounts will let you borrow 50%, uh, up to 50,000 out of an employer-sponsored fund and actually pay yourself back interest. We always tell people to look for applicable federal rate loans from a family member, which is basically a private money at the lowest rate possible where the IRS doesn't consider it a gift. So we look at a couple of different creative ways um, to sometimes gap that difference between what your project will be funded for and what it will cost to build. If it's an attached ADU, it's a little bit more cloudy, but it's also a lot less money. Um, so I say that attached ADU conversions start at about $100 a square foot, and we're building new standalone semi-custom detached ADUs for $225 a square foot. So that will give some people um, some perspective. But what I would really want to drive home here is that all lenders are not created equally. I would start with small local credit unions and banks. Think one or two spots, tiny parking lots. Um, call around people in your area. Lenders in your area are usually going to be um, the best option until you get it built. Then you can take it to Rocket or Quicken or United Wholesale or w Wells Fargo, whoever your big lender is, uh, to stabilize it after it's built or converted. Awesome. So, so just a quick recap there, right? So if you are thinking about doing an ADU and you do need financing for it, you know, Go ahead to that local credit union, which is pretty common amongst real estate investors. Go there and ask for that 90-10, 90% LTV loan. Do the rehab, and then you can refinance it with whoever you want. Maybe even lump it in to your, your residential mortgage. Maybe refinance the whole property, and you can maybe even pull out even more than you put into it. Right? I think that's probably the name of the game is to like put all your money out. Um, Derek, yeah. I've got a question. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, go yeah. Ahead. I was just going to say two more things that, that are really important here. Right now, yeah. I mean, a year ago, I would have said pull a cash out refi and do the whole project. That was in Racer 3 for a top tier borrower. Now they're six and a half. Um, so look at a second mortgage over a cash out refi. So if you have, say, we'll use median average, $400,000 for a house, and you have a note on your house at 3% for four hundred, and you need to build 100,000 ADU, you're not going to go pull out a $500,000 note at six and a half. Go get a second for the 100 you need to leave that primary first on the house at 3% in place. And then the second thing I wanted to say is the most affordable way to build an ADU is to buy one that's already done. So mm -hmm. if you're looking for your first property, um, a lot of people are looking for a, you know, people that, that like you, love you for that matter. They're looking for a five bedroom house with four bathrooms. They're looking for more space so they can break that house down and house hack it hard, right? Well, I would also say look for a potential accessory dwelling unit house because um, not only are you going to be able to show up as a house hack, you, you'd be able to show up at the closing table with, say, 5% down with a standard conventional loan. Um, you're going to get 30-year fixed rate money. You're not going to have to refinance again. There's not going to be origination fees again. And you can also now, this is only six month, months old due to some federal regulation changes, you can use 75% of the ADU income towards your LTV, like you can on a true multifamily. And you didn't used to be able to do that with accessory dwelling units. So to the, the, the biggest question I get is how am I gonna fund this ADU and why wouldn't I just go buy another house? And the easiest way to avoid funding an ADU project is to just buy a house that already has one. And I tell people to just look at one thing. When you look at a, if your budget's 500,000, but you find a house that's 600,000 and has an ADU that's gonna rent for $1,500 a month, back those numbers into your payment because you get 75% credit for that leased up amount. So you can borrow um, almost 30% more than you think you can and that you're pre-approved for if it has an ADU that you can rent. And does that ADU have to be permitted in order for the lenders to accept that? Or if it was an unpermitted ADU, it, it depends. Take the rent. From it, that? it depends. Um, the technical answer would be yes. It has to be permitted, but there are some Freddie and Fannie guidelines that say if the appraiser, because they will do an appraisal on rents, just like they would do appraisal on purchase, and if the appraiser can find up to three other non-conforming legacy properties similar in the area, they can use those rents. So I'm not a, a lender in your state. Don't take my word for gospel. But again, lenders are not created equally. I mean, how many times have we had underwriters tell us no, 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 or yes, yes, yes. And, you know, stuff changes all the time. Stuff gets through, stuff doesn't. Uh, but most of the time we, we are going to want to 
um, permit these. I would just say that we wouldn't want to buy an ADU that's not permitted in an area where the city doesn't allow them because we don't have a good clear path to victory, right? So I'll only use yeah. the the not permitted ADU strategy if it's in a city that is ADU friendly. All right. So Derek, um, I've got a question on about converting garages because I think mm -hmm. one thing that a lot of people like to do, especially because it doesn't really increase the footprint of like house on the property mm -hmm. is to convert let's see a two car garage and to add an extra bedroom or maybe a unit or whatever. And so I guess, what's your opinion on that? And does the removal of a garage impact the value of the home more or less than adding that ADU? Great questions. Yeah. You know, I, I do garage conversions. Um, they're not my favorite. In fact, I got so many calls on garage conversion ADUs the last couple of years. I just bought two properties and did garage conversions and shared every step of the way on my YouTube channel. Um, I've got a, a playlist on my YouTube channel that's, I think, 34 videos, uh, including a, a, about a 10 or 15 minute video finish that I did with Bigger Pockets showing that whole process of how we we cut open the slab and we bring plumbing in. So if it's fairly convenient, in other words, if you're not too far away from the sewer line, garage conversions rock. They're really affordable. As far as the value, uh, most appraisals in our area are going to give anywhere from eight to $15,000 for each parking bay. So we'll just say $10,000 per parking bay, two car garage that's 20 by 40. You'd get a value of approximately $20,000 for that. And what we're seeing um, throughout the nation, and I, I track this um, nationwide, is is we're getting closer to 80 to 90 percent of the average square foot price of the house for the added ADU. For example, if you have a thousand square foot house that sells for 300,000, the square foot value of that house is approximately $300 a square foot. If you converted a 500 square foot garage, you'd probably get 80 or 90 percent of the $150,000 projected value of that same $300 uh, a square foot mark. So it's about three times as valuable as the garage space itself. But, so big long but there, there's um, there's goals in different areas and there's, there's different marketability um, to different homes. If you're in a neighborhood that's in a good school district and there's lots of three and four bedroom houses and there's families, you know, they're gonna expect a garage if they're going to pay market rents for that place. So if you're going to lose the garage and turn this into a, basically a side-by-side -side duplex for, for normal no, nomenclature, but really it's a house with a garage ADU. Um, I always tell people to plan for some other separate detached or shed roof storage somewhere because people that rent the primary house are going to want um, to use space. But garage conversions are awesome. They're really popular. They're um, probably the second most affordable option behind a master bedroom conversion. Mm. Most people think a basement conversion is, is the easiest and basement conversions are, are usually some of the biggest pains in the neck due to um, making egress windows. You know, we've got to have windows that are no more than 40 inches high and 5.7 square feet of open space. Plumbing is usually in the floor of the house, which happens to be the ceiling of the basement. So you have to put in pump systems to get your waste up. So a lot of times, unless there's a bathroom, again, the bathroom is the key point. If it's a detached garage with a bathroom, if it's a master with a bathroom, if it's a basement with a bathroom, it's going to be easy. Mm, good to know. Good to know. Awesome, man. Um, I guess you want to go into maybe like one of your, so I, you know, it sounds like you really started doing this about 20, 30 years ago, right? So you're certainly probably like the export expert in this field. And that's why they call you that ADU guy. But why don't we go into like maybe a deal or something that you did recently where you bought a house without the ADU, you built the ADU and, you know, give us like what those renting for and all that. So like kind of just like a little case study. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So like I said, I built that first ADU in 1996 and I haven't looked back. I, I've never bought anything else. I've never sold the house. Like talk about being, um, you know, very narrow, but very deep. Like this is all I do. It's my life's work. And so there's been an evolution. Like they haven't all been this good. But one of my, my last deals is I've, I've taken house hacking to the next level and now I just house hack and I land hack at the same time. So for example, uh, I'm, I'm in a, my, my office is in the downstairs of a detached garage ADU right now on a property um, that we bought that was, how do we hack the house? How do we hack the lot? 
and how do we add a lot? So we bought a house on a half acre and the house was a four three. It was just what I described. We look for a house that has a detached kind of master bedroom area. So we bought the primary house in an area that we know loves ADUs. They have great ADU legislation and they're easy to permit. We bought the primary house. We did a legal attached side-by-side -side ADU conversion. We bought the house for, oh, I think it was 350,000. Um, put about 40 grand into the ADU conversion and had the, appraised, the house appraised a little over 600,000. And then we took that half acre lot and we did a legal lot of record split with a minor land partition and split the lot in half. And then I took that second lot and built a primary house with an attached ADU. And then we also built a detached ADU. So in the market that I like to invest in, we're allowed to do two ADUs, one attached and one detached. So the reason we, we build attached ADUs here is because it's the only way we can get the second one. So we took a property that nobody else wanted, that every investor in town had walked through. There was probably 20 realtor cards on the, on the counter when we bought this place. Uh, that was one unit and we turned it into five units, four of them brand new. After we split the lot and built, uh, I, I built the house and I built the two ADUs. Um, I think we're we're probably pushing uh, 1.5 or 1.6 total value for the package for um, probably 25% of that cost. Uh, and that was levered too. So there's like none of our own money in, in this deal. And a couple of things I would highlight with this project is this isn't fancy. This isn't totally scalable for everybody, but um, I call it the get rich slow plan. We lived in the front house. Like we lived there while we converted it. Um, it took almost a year to do the ADU conversion and the legal lot split. So after we got the lot split, we were able to use that as our departing residence to get our next primary residence on the house that I had just built. So in one year, we remodeled the ADU, split the lot and built a brand new house. And just people tell me all the time, how do you house hack? You've got enough property. You don't need to do that. Why do you still do it? Well, because A, it makes sense. I live in a high price market and I like to put low to no down. And B, moving isn't as um, big of a pain in the neck as you think it is when you're literally just moving into the backyard of a, of, a, of a place you're developing. So that's kind of what it's come to now. What started is I, I would buy a house and I would convert the garage. Um, and now it's turned into we're buying big plots of land where we can build multiple houses and multiple ADUs on multiple legal lot splits but it takes a year or two. The, the planning and zoning um, is really the secret. So, so few people talk about planning and zoning in our business. And it is literally the rule book of how we make money. And, and it's not that hard. Like people just shy away from it. So for people listening, um, again, you don't have to be scared away by become a planning and zoning expert, but maybe just call your local planner and ask them, hey, what's the greatest and best use of my property? Could I build an ADU? Could I build a second um, you know, multifamily house here. So look at the planning, you know, look at planning and zoning, a, a 30 day stay stuff. I've, I've been in your book. Um, I've taught, I've, I've looked at some of the things you girls have done and you as well, Craig, like everybody's doing all these creative things. Um, if you can find out how to do the creative things within the local and state legislation, like that's where the gold is. Wow. I am just like blown yeah, away. <laughs> I'm like, man, I am doing it all wrong. Yeah. That's amazing. I think just it's so intimidating to build. I think if you haven't done that before, and of course, it seems like you rinse and repeat and you've done the same thing again and mm -hmm. again. But even no. just thinking to my property, this is the second property I have where my first property, I've already sold it, but it was on a double lot. And I just, I looked into it very lightly and it was in St. Louis and the area is not the best. So, you know, whatever. But it would have been very easy because the lot was gigantic and we would just have to put up a fence and then get a developer. Um, but yeah, it just seems so intimidating. So I think maybe the fact that you've just done it a lot and have the same crew. I'm just curious. It seems mm -hmm. like you're shaking your head. Not that scary. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm, I I get that a lot too. I'm not shaking my head at you, like no disrespect. I just mean that so many people flip houses. Like I, I watch content every day. It was like she was a teacher last year and this year she flipped 10 houses and she's done it right. Like 
flipping houses, doing remodels, doing renos, doing burr, like everybody's burring everything. And, you know, as a, a 30 year contractor, remodels are so much harder than new builds. They're so much harder. There's so many more variables. If you have, um, you know, a, a basic, simple set of plans. I have two sets of ADU plans that I give away for free on my website, that aduguy.com. Um, if your city has a couple of free, simple, pre-approved plans, get a hold of those plans, shop them around. What's so cool about a new build, if if you're on a, a lot that's fairly flat, close to utilities, is there's no outside variables. Everything is controllable. You start with a blank slate and you can control every aspect of the build. You can't do that on a remodel. So, so many people come to me and they, they say, Derek, how are you a developer? How do you do all these infill developments? And I'm like, I promise you it's so much easier than remodeling that 1930s house that you just did. So it's, it's really just a self-limiting belief because people haven't done a small development. They think that it's hard. Um, the second part of your question I would address is if you buy a house with a big double lot in St. Louis or anywhere for that matter, just be looking at the code and looking at the, the, the land hack, if you will. Like, how could I just split that lot and sell the lot to pay for the remodel of the house? Like, you don't have to always do the development yourself. You could partner with somebody. If you have an awesome spot in Colorado that's got room for an ADU, call somebody like me and say, hey, how do we get this done? You don't have to do it all yourself. So the, the self-limiting belief isn't just like, oh my gosh, I can't do this. It's that we forget to pick up the 10,000 pound cell phone and call somebody and ask them how they did it because it's it's really simpler than than remodeling. So I was shaking my head when people say, oh, how it's so hard to build. It's like, oh my gosh, it's I've built um, you know hundreds of ADUs and I've remodeled hundreds of houses and I would, uh, it's 10 times easier to build new. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, the, the, the easier means cheaper too. It, it so is cheaper. It is. And, and everything is controlled. Yeah. Um, I will say there's a caveat to that, that it is in markets that I know. And not only do I just, do I know the market, like I know what it'll rent for. I know the, the planning officials. I know the building inspectors. I know the guy that owns the concrete company. Like there's, there's relationships Absolutely. that you have to leverage. It's, it's the who, not how. So I couldn't go deploy my strategy really as efficiently um, out of state all over the place. But when you have a system, you have a set of plans that you like, that you know people love to rent, and you've built it once, it's going to be really easy around, to go build it 10 more times. How would you vet a builder? And I don't know if you've done that recently because you've probably been working with the same person for years. But what would you recommend for somebody who was wanting to do this? Because... I, in the past, had talked to my contractor about it, and he was like, oh, yeah, we could do that. And he never gave me a quote, and it was this whole thing. And I was like, okay, that's just not what they do. They just do handyman stuff and remodel and whatever. But if you were going to go out and just find somebody totally new that was a builder, how do you know someone worth working with versus just somebody kind of random that will tell you yes? Great question. So I, I just did a, a video on this too. Um, it's an amazing uh, piece of advice that took a long time for me to learn, but it's all about checking references. So I would suggest to anybody um, to go to your local lumber yard, not a box store, but an actual local lumber yard where the professional shop, go to the counter and ask them who has integrity, who's been paying their bill here for 10 years or more, who would you hire to build an ADU in your backyard? Try to get three names and then I always call those three people and I would say interview the three builders and ask them for references. And when they give you references, um, call those references. I would not hire anybody to build me an ADU who has not built an ADU in my market. And I, I want to hear from a couple of the people that they built for. So if you meet Sarah, she's built an ADU for the Joneses down the street, call the Joneses. Hey, how was Sarah? How was her crew? Did they show up on time? Did they smell like alcohol? Did it take longer? Whatever the case is, good builders will have good references and they will not wait to give you those references. If somebody in this market in the last 10 years, if they don't have 100 references to give you, they're fly by night. So go to a professional lumber yard where the professional shop and ask them who they would use. That's, that's what I personally do. And then there's also a couple of companies out there that vet contractors in your area. But even if it's through your social network, you, you know, you're at a meetup and you just, you get to, Mike comes around to you, what you're working on and what you need. Hey, 
Um, I'd like to build an ADU. Does anybody in here know a contractor who's built an ADU in Denver? Um, even if somebody comes highly recommended from somebody that you know, like, and trust, still vet them. I see people every day embark on these $100,000 projects and they didn't call a single reference. Like put in a little bit of time up front to protect yourself because as developers, as investors, as realtors, whatever we're doing today, like we have to take accountability. Like everybody gets burned by a contractor because they burn themselves by not doing their own it. due diligence to hire well, them. Well, it seems like we need to transition to the second part of our show. But before we do that, do you have any final words of wisdom for our listeners? Yeah, I would just say uh, that the ADU, the house hack is is the biggest cheat code to wealth. It's absolutely changed my life. It's changed so many people's lives that I know. Even if you think you can't afford to get onto the property ladder, um, get your credit checked, talk to a lender, get pre-approved, look for a house that you can get roommates or add an ADU. Um, it, it's not hard. It's just hard work. So please consider the the you know, the low down house hacking strategy to get on the property ladder. That's that's probably the only Great. advice I would give. Um, Great. Our well, um, let's move into the final part of our show. Um, this is the final four. We're going to ask you four questions that we ask all of our guests. And our first one is, what are you reading right now? Reading? Oh, my goodness. I'm like, mm -hmm. I consume so much economic content, like my head's going to explode. Uh, for lighter reading, though, um, uh, I guess real estate base. I'll go with um, the wise investor rich. and yeah. I'm not reading it. I'm listening to it on audible. And I don't know if you guys know rich and Kathy, but it's rich's book and rich is just an awesome dude. I like what he stands for. And he's got such a calm, soothing voice and he actually narrates the, the uh, audible version. So I'm just about through that. That's the book I'm on right now. I'm not a huge reader. And I put that out there because I think there's a lot of people in real estate that are visual learners and maybe didn't excel in school and maybe don't love to read. That does not mean you can't be successful. So if people in your network are telling you to read, yeah, get it on Audible advice. and put it in your ear while All you're right, doing something Craig, else. All right, Craig, can you do question number two? Yeah. Uh, Derek, what is the best piece of advice you've ever received? You know, um, Delay gratification, probably like long, anything that like, I'm just thinking like lo take a long-term view. Um, if it's a quote, it's probably happiness is the byproduct of doing the right thing. I spent a lot of time and a lot of years working for my own freedom and to be financially free and to have this freedom. And what I've found is that I'm happiest when I'm helping other people. I'm happiest when I'm trying to get outside of myself. If like I do the next right thing, I'm going to be way happier than any money or success I've ever achieved. So um, do the right thing. Think long term. Love that. Well, you tapped into this a little bit, but question number three is what is your why? I imagine when you've made so much money on even just one property, what keeps you going to do the next one? You know, I'm just a busybody. Like I'm, I really am kind of insane. I, I love to work. I'm always grinding. Um, I think it'll change, but you know, forever, I was a fireman. I was a, I was a full-time fireman in a structural fire department. Whenever I wasn't on shift, I was building. And whenever I wasn't building, I was on shift. And I just, all I wanted to do was run and ski. And I finally retired from the firehouse and I'm living off my real estate portfolio and I'm running and skiing um, and I'm bored. So I'm like, oh gosh, I got to, I have to have a new why. So lately it's been, you know, I've hit financial freedom. Um, that's, that's been an amazing thing. I'm so blessed, but now I want to retire people in my family. I, I want, to be able to have the funds to just retire, like, retire my mom and retire, um, just retire family members where the wealth, the wealth doesn't do any good for me. I don't really even spend any money, but if I had a surplus, I could just start telling people they don't have to work anymore. Like, how do I pass on the feeling I have? And I can do a little bit of that by, by teaching people what I do, but it, it's just as gratifying to be able to just solve somebody else's problem with capital. So my, my why has changed. Like this is a new thing. This is the last 90 days. I've got a new breath of fresh air. I just put four properties under contract in a market that's like almost circling the drain. And I'm just you going should be for like it Oprah. because I have, it's like I have It's like you get an ADU and life. now you get an ADU. You just build them all for your family members. <laughs> and then they have passive income yes. because yeah. it's all like their own little ADUs that they now oh, get an I extra would... two grand a month or whatever from. So You're... You're telling my story. I was I was at the YMCA the other night and there was a couple there and I think they're homeless and like I could hear them talking as they were walking out of the gym. They were showering there. 
And it like choked me up. And I just thought, you know, the kind of wealth I want is the wealth that would just say, hey, I'm going to build you a house. Mm. Like you guys get cool. that house. So that's funny you say that. That's amazing. But you be your bucket list one day. Um, is like just build, build a random person a house to see what they uh, what they do. Um, awesome, man. All right, so last question is, um, when you were a kid, what name did you give your favorite toy or stuffed animal, and what was that stuffed animal? You know, I don't think I ever had a stuffed animal. And I don't mean to sound like this rigid stoic, but, like, I just didn't really have any toys growing up, but that wasn't what we did. I did have a um, pet box turtle for a few years that I named April because this is, like, late 80s and Teenage Mutant Ninja. I'm, I was born in 1980, so it was like mid 80s, late 80s. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles were really popular. And she was like the only female on that show. So I had a, I had a box turtle named April. That's as close as I could get. Wow, okay, there you go. Well, hey, that's still something. To a stuffed like animal, it. sorry. Yeah. yeah, awesome, man. Derek, well, hey, thanks so much for coming on the show, man. Where can people find out more about you? You mentioned that aduguy.com, anywhere else? Yeah, you know, I'm probably most active on Instagram. Um, I post the ADUs I'm building. I'm always building something. Uh, I post all the time. I've, I've always putting up reels about some funky project or property management. I manage all my stuff. So I try to share um, the war stories, like the bad parts of what we do. Uh, most active there. That ADU guy everywhere, though. That ADU guy Instagram, um, Facebook, TikTok. Uh, that ADU guy.com, my phone number, my actual phone number is on the top of my website. And I say this because I want people to use it. But if you call me, be ready to take action. I get probably three calls a day of people that say, I didn't think you were going to answer. And I say, of course, I'm going to answer. Like, how can I help you? And they don't have a question. They just call because my number's there. So Love if it. you call me, have a plan. Love it, man. Well, Derek, thanks again for being so, I mean, such, such a good episode, right? And like a little different than what we usually do. I think we kind of just like, we all just like, we're like, oh my God, there's this guy knows like everything there is to know about ADUs. And you gave us an hour, an hour, I mean, an hour like course on it, but really like, I'm sure there's so much more that you didn't disclose. And so definitely go check out that ADU guy if you were thinking about, you know, juicing more out of each property right uh thanks so much for coming on the show man i think what you dropped some serious some good bombs here and again i gotta start like reevaluating some of my properties and see what you know what we might be able to do well, well my friends in the industry go right to the top so go ahead and call me um all the stuff i do is also on on youtube so i try to share all the the longer form video on youtube and then i'm i'm doing some stuff with bigger pockets i've done a few adu episodes for them and i'm doing a ground up ADU build three series. So we're, it's almost done. I, it'll probably air this spring of, this is 2023 right now, but uh, we're, we're doing, I did a video already of, of every single step of an ADU build from literally a hole in the ground to like handing the keys over. Um, so a lot of the stuff I'm doing, I'm just trying to open source and give away. So it's, uh, it's out there. You just got to find it, but so, anybody can call me, including you too. Of I course. appreciate, appreciate that there. Real quick. Do you, do you recommend that anybody try to DIY the ADU? Yeah, that's that's what I recommend most people do. And I, I don't mean swing the hammer and stand up the walls. I mean, if you can be decisive and make a decision and run a schedule, you're better than nine out of 10 builders that you would hire anyway, um, mm -hmm. including myself for the first 20 years I was in business. So yes, you can manage a project and save 30 to 40%. That does not mean you have to do the work. And I, I didn't really get to say it, but my three big tips for saving money, because that's, that's my whole spin is, affordable accessory dwelling units. And it's start with a simple design, self-manage the project and do as much of the work as you possibly can yourself. That's how you keep your costs down and you drive your revenue and your yield up because it's it's just natural, but the, the building industry is pulling one way for, for profits to feed their family and the investor is pulling the other way to, to drive yields. The only way to get that tug of war pulling on the same way is to be you know your own your own contractor. Sure. That makes perfect sense. Derek. Awesome. man. thanks again so much for coming on the show and giving us the time to, uh, you know, disclose 30 years of knowledge here, just boiled down here in you know, an hour. So, uh, I think that's a great thing about podcasts. And again, man, thanks so much for coming on the show and we'll, we'll certainly be in touch. Bye. My pleasure. All right. See you, man. And that was Derek Shirell, AKA that ADU guy. Z, what'd you think of Derek? 
Man, that was fascinating. And, you know, I love that the podcast brings us all kinds of people that we can apply to our own portfolios and our own lives. And this was really something that I've thought about over the years. I own a place in Colorado Springs since 2018, I think, and I'd looked into it very lightly, but it is a really interesting concept to think, wow, what if we took our really ugly backyard, which is what we have right now, um, and added a whole nother brand spanky new beautiful unit um, what, you know, what possibilities are there? And I love how he talked about all the creative ways to fund it, because I think people think it's refinance or HELOC, but there seems to be cool construction loans, second mortgages, all kinds of awesome opportunities. So I'm definitely going to take a second look at it. Yeah, I think it's an amazing way to, again, just get a little bit more juice mm -hmm. out of each property that you have. And, you know, it's, it's a lot nicer to have, you know, five or 10 properties that cash flow you maybe $2,000 a month each versus 20 that are $1,000 a month each, whatever that is, whatever your number is. And so, yeah, I, I think it is, there's certain, there's a, something to be a little bit more efficient. And uh, I think adding an ADU is a great way to do that. I love it. Well, guys, if you are listening all the way to this part, um, we always like to ask for a rating or review anywhere that you listen to podcasts. Another big ask is that if you've read either of our books, The House Hacking Strategy or 30 Day Stay, consider writing a review wherever you purchase that book because those really help us get those books in lots of other people's hands and we appreciate it. Absolutely. Love, love, love those reviews. Love to chat with you guys each week and we will see you all next week. That's it for this episode of Investify. We hope that these nuggets of real estate wisdom lead to more savvy financial planning and a clearer path towards financial freedom. For more content like this, subscribe to the show at investify.com. Don't forget to leave a rating and share it with your friends. Together, we can transform more real estate newbies into successful and clever investors. Thank you so much for listening. See you on the next one.